A very warm welcome to you all for tonight's discussion of the paper, IRM, Putting Theory into Practice for UK DB Pension Schemes by the Integrated Risk Management Working Party. Uh, before I begin for proper, I'd like to ask Colin Wilson, our president, to say a few words. Um, thanks very much, Gareth, uh, and good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to Staple Inn for what I'm sure will be a, a fascinating discussion this evening. Uh, I'm very grateful to our chairman for allowing me just to have an opportunity to say a few words before we begin. Uh, as president, I've chosen to focus this year on um, thought leadership. And in sessional meetings like this evening's have always been important ways in which we as actuaries showcase our thought leadership. In my presidential address, I highlighted two different definitions of thought leadership. One view is that thought leadership is using expertise and insight to create and extend thinking and understanding in a way that others can benefit from. Uh, and another view is that thought leadership is adding genuine value by sharing knowledge and information that matters. Uh, so these two definitions obviously reflect different aspects. Sometimes we need to use our own specialist expertise to create new thinking. Sometimes we just need to recognize kind of what's important and to pass it on. Uh, in my view, uh, tonight's session does both of those, and I'm very grateful to the working party. Obviously, these events um, bring us together as a, as a member communi community. They act as catalysts for our um, innovative thinking. Uh, and I think they exemplify a collaborative approach to problem solving that will help to drive our profession forward. And I'm very pleased to see uh, this evening's paper uh, partly as a collaborative effort between uh, the Risk Management Board and the Pensions Board. Uh, so I'm extremely grateful to all our members who give up their time to help advance the profession in this way. Uh, but for me, it's critical that when we um, engage in thought leadership, we're also outwardly focused, and we take our thinking out into the wider world. So it's also about us sharing the results of our, our research and our thinking, um, both with our own members, but also more widely. And I think doing this, it will help us to realise my vision for our profession, which I set out in my presidential address, which is based on kind of three ambitions, that, that I want us to be seen as a dynamic, forward-thinking professional body, a profession that generates ideas that others listen to and talk about, and, and indeed a go-to body for other decision makers and influencers to come and talk to us. Uh, and, I, and I certainly hope that events like tonight will help to achieve that. And if you're not directly involved in research yourself or in working parties, I would urge you uh, to think about uh, participating in that and how else you might be able to contribute uh, as an actuary. And one of the things that we can all do is act as ambassadors for our profession. Um, so we can all help to contribute to that kind of wider understanding of what it is that we as actuaries do and to help to sell our skills to those who need them. And in my presidential address, I, again, I urged all actuaries to do three things. It was to think broadly in everything that we do, to talk positively about our work and the work of actuaries, and to engage collaboratively with others. And again, in my view, that tonight's sessional paper uh, has done all of those things. Uh, and I'm particularly pleased to see that, uh, as well as collaborating, as I say, between risk management actuaries and pensions actuaries, uh, actually collaboration is the first of the 10 commandments which we have to obey this evening. So thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to, uh, to finish us by thanking um, the whole of the Integrated Risk Management Working Party. I think it's a fantastic piece of work. Uh, looking forward to hearing the discussion. And I'd now like to hand back to Gareth Connolly, our chair. Thank you. Thank you now, before we commence the meeting proper, I need to mention a few housekeeping points. Anyone wishing to claim CPD for this meeting is responsible for entering the CPD on their own online record. By collecting your name badge, your attendance will have been listed on the system for auditing purposes. If you do not have a name badge, you'll need to sign the registration form. Secondly, the meeting, as you'll probably gather, is being filmed for publication in the British Actuarial Journal. So please state your name before making any contribution. Please wait for the microphone. And most importantly, please speak into the microphone. If you have any concerns about being filmed, please speak to me or another member of the IFOA, um, a member of the IFOA staff. Uh, may I ask for you to all turn off your mobile phones, please? And finally, the, we're not expecting a fire alarm, so 
If the fire alarm sounds, please leave by the nearest fire exit. Staff, on, staff will be on hand to help you. I would now like to formally introduce tonight's topic, putting IRM theory into practice. You'll see from the agenda that there's quite a few speakers, there's quite a bit to get through, uh, but there will be 30 minutes uh, allotted to questions. So hopefully if we keep to time, we can have the full 30 minutes. Um, IRM, it, it's a topic I've been interested in for some time, going back to the days when it was known as a financial management plan in the 2012 regulator's annual funding statement. Um, now, another regulator has published guidance on IRM in 2015. Uh, th this working party was actually set up in, it was actually set up in 2014. Um, the paper says 2015. We set it up in 2014 and I had someone in charge who was a pensions expert and for various reasons, it didn't succeed. So the key learning that I found by having um, Andrew to chair it is that pensions risk management, it might be new to pensions actuaries and those in the pensions profession. Risk management's old hat to others in the actuarial profession. So if you think something's new, go and speak to a colleague in a different area. They're bound to have thought about the same sorts of things that you want to think about, but in more detail. And have done it already for many years. So, Back to the Regulator's Code of Practice and the guidance. Now, that, that was helpful, but I just thought it would be useful while I was on the pensions board, while I was chairing it, that wouldn't it be great to have a working party to go away and really put the meat on the bones of IRM to show what it could look like in practice? And thankfully, a working party was established, uh, and I'm delighted to be here to chair this session. Before I introduce the opener, I'd like to spe say a special thanks to Andrew Hitchcocks who agreed to chair the party, as I say, for the, uh, for the second attempt that, that worked in 2015. Andrew's a qualified actuary with over 35 years' experience in the London market. He's Chief Risk Officer and Solvency II Programme Director at Tokyo Marine Kiln, one of the larger managing agents at Lloyd's of London. He's also a member of council and a member of the Risk Management Board, having previously chaired it. He's also recently become a grandfather, of which he's very proud. I hope he is also not quite as proud, but proud nonetheless of this, of this working party paper. So thank you very much, Andrew. Let me thank Andrew in the usual way. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, the opener, Paul Bryce. For those of you who don't know Paul, Paul is a chartered accountant, chartered tax advisor, and member of the Chartered Institute of Securities and Investment. Lots of charters. He's the founding chair of the Employer Covenant Working Group. In his day job, he's director of trustee and client services for RPMI Limited, the executive company, um, executive company of the Railways Pension Scheme Trustee. His role involves leading the Employer Covenant team, which advises the trustee on IRM matters. Um, He's been heavily involved in setting up the trustees' approach to IRM. And just to give you an idea of the, the day job that Paul has, his scheme has close to 350,000 members with more than 100 sections and more than 100 employers. So I'm delighted to ask Paul to open this session. Thank you very much, Gary. And good evening, and thank you for the privilege of talking to you about something which I am deeply interested, which is integrated funding and integrated risk management for pension schemes. And just to build a little bit on what Gareth said and give you a bit of context, because the theme of my discussion is a strategic overview against the backlog of putting theory into practice, just share a couple of thoughts with you about our scheme and some of the challenges we have. As I go through this brief presentation, I'm going to try and bring out some practical lessons that we've learnt about the challenges of both integrated funding and integrated risk management. As Gareth says, we have over 100 sections. These are standalone, self-sufficient mini pension schemes, although the largest one, Network Rail, is close to five or six billion pounds. So it's quite a big pension scheme in its own right. But these sections comprise Sections sponsored by everyone from across the railway industry, Network Rail, the train operating companies, train leasing companies, train manufacturing companies, train maintenance companies, you name it, people to do with the railway. It's a diverse group of employers. Some small owner managed businesses at the one end, some businesses with involvement with the government at the other. And therefore, the whole conundrum of how we work to fund these various sections and manage the funding risks 
associated with them is a deeply interesting exercise. I'm very privileged that I work for RPMI as a captive advisor, and I work with internal colleagues who specialize in investments and colleagues, actuaries, who specialize in pensions policy matters, and indeed our scheme actuary, James Winkle, is only three rows back with his colleague Debbie this evening. So I'd like to look at this problem through three questions. Firstly, I'd like just to step back and say what brings us to integrated funding and integrated risk management? What's changed? Secondly, to look at some areas that I believe integrated risk management and funding can really add value compared to a more point solution approach. And thirdly and finally, what I'd like to do is just explore the real value of collaboration between both employers and trustees and the advisory teams in getting to some innovative and good outcomes for pension schemes and their members. So, Gareth, would it be possible just to forward... I was your pass. Thank you very, very much indeed. So just to remind ourselves, scheme-specific funding is a shade over 10 years old, and there's been a huge process of evolution. My profession, the employer covenant profession, didn't exist 10 years ago. In this austere building, I'm in amongst professionals whose body has gone back years. But nonetheless, there's been a process of evolution, and for example, what employer covenant has meant and how it contributes to the debate is something that I would argue has shifted quite markedly in recent years. I like to think of pension schemes when I step back and think about them. Their business model is really five cash flows. It's contributions, it's investment returns, it's investment realizations to meet liabilities to members and the costs of running the scheme. Those five key cash flows can be looked at independently, but actually in many ways are interdependent cash flows. And that's, in my view, where the real value of an integrated funding approach comes in. Once we start to look at those cash flows interdependently, exploring, for example, how an underperformance or overperformance in investments might leave a scheme funded and what the requirements for cash from the covenant will be, we start to get into a rich debate of different possibilities and options. And I would contest that integrated funding is the choices we make or trustees make with employers about how they fund the scheme. And integrated risk management is the plan that is put in place to deal with off-plan performance. Semantics may be, but in practice, I think they're two sides of the same coin. So where can an integrated approach to looking at these cash flows and their interdependencies add real value. What, what's the difference between that and a point solution arrangement whereby the covenant advisor comes in and drops a covenant assessment on the desk, someone else looks at the investment strategy, and someone else looks at the valuation of the liabilities with all the complexities that brings? Well, I would contest that you get a much clearer view of the dynamics of a pension scheme once you start to think about all of these things together. I've chosen three effects here, which I think are worth pausing on. Sometimes there is a close correlation between the trading performance of an employer and the likely expected returns on, say, equity markets or return-seeking assets. Sometimes the correlation may be negligible. So starting to think about how one of those levers moves as against the other and what that might mean for funding is, I would argue, crucial and very much a theme of TPR's IRM guidance, thinking bilaterally and together about the various risks. One thing that I think is very important to consider is opportunity cost. It may be tempting for a section with relative, well, a pension scheme rather, uh, with an employer with relatively stable but modest cash flows to think about piling that cash into a de-risking investment strategy but what if the analysis showed that there was a far better opportunity to invest that cash in the business or some other way, possibly with support from a parent company to facilitate a more on-risk investment strategy? I know that's one of the matters that the case studies consider. And finally, when we start to think of integrated funding, 
we really start to get visibility on the effect of pensions gearing. And by pensions gearing, I mean a sponsor may be a healthy business. They may have generated steady profitability over many years. They may have a healthy balance sheet. But if they have an enormous pension scheme in tow, one of the things you can start to see as you stress test these cash flows against each other is the impact of a relatively small movement in the pension scheme and the demands that that would place on the employer. And in practical terms, what we've sought to do in RPMI, in advising the trustee, is we get all of our professionals, investment professionals, policy professionals, and covenant professionals to work systematically and regularly together to think about and model and stress test these different possible outcomes before we're engaging with the employer community and making our advice recommendations to the trustee. And we do that within a framework. We've got a framework for our investments which considers risk and return and liquidity. We've got a framework for our covenant that considers covenant strength and likely recovery periods. But those are just starting points. Once you've got the starting point, it's then a process of iteration and really careful thought with the employer and the trustee as to what the appropriate solution is for that pension scheme. So all of this, to my mind, strongly points to effective joint working. I think, and I don't want to steal Marion's thunder, I think collaboration, as the chairman, just the president just said, is central to the success of this approach. And that's not just collaboration as between employer and trustee, recognizing their respective legal obligations, it's collaboration between the advisory groups. And our experience is, from the conversations that I just described, where we sit around the table and we put our sections under the microscope and we think about the different options and ways in which risk can be protected and managed but opportunity costs can be minimized, you get some greater shared understandings, creative thinking and fresh ideas. The ideas that come forward are not the preserve of one profession or another, but importantly, you get better informed choices, in my view, between trustee and employer. And finally, given this is integrated risk management, there is a stronger and actionable platform against which to manage risk. I am not a strong advocate of huge risk management plans with endless minutiae and short-termism and so forth. I believe once you have got a view of what the key risks of the pension scheme are, you do understand the financial flows, you're then in a good place to put together a plan that will correct off-plan performance when it really matters and really needs to be attended to. And that can only happen, in my view, successfully once there is a clear platform of information and understanding between all the parties to enable that debate to happen. And with that brief introduction, I'll hand over to Marion to talk about the Ten Commandments. Thank you. A director at Deloitte with nearly 15 years' experience in the UK market of advising trustees and sponsors. Marion also sits on the council for the IFOA. And yes, as Paul said, Marion will give us an overview of the, the structure of the paper and the Ten Commandments. Thank you. Thanks very much. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the paper is really about how to put integrated risk management into practice. So what we didn't want to do was give lots and lots of theories and principles. Uh, there were, however, 10 key things and lessons that we learned as we went through the process that we thought it was worth capturing up front and, and that could be useful moving forward. So the first is collaboration, and we've heard a lot about collaboration already this evening, so I won't spend too much time on this, um, not least because I have 10 minutes for 10 commandments. <laughs> but somebody very wise said to me once, uh, to the worm in the horseradish, the whole world is horseradish. Now, if you see an old person walking down the street, we'll all look at them and think, oh, I wonder if they've got adequate pension provision and how well their DB scheme is funded. And a doctor will look at them and think, oh, that hip looks a little out of line. I wonder you know, whether they've got appropriate medical cover. And so there are always different angles to looking at every situation. And without collaboration, you will miss something. We were a fairly diverse team. 
uh, we were immersed in pensions across, across the team. We also had expertise without the pensions field. Um, but even sitting around the table going through our various case studies, without exception, we had missed things in our own silos that were highlighted by socializing the case studies that we came up with, uh, with colleagues, with people outside of the pension sphere, with people with different skill sets. So collaboration is absolutely essential. You cannot do this on your own. Um, objectives <laughs> was the second piece that we learned about. Now, it might sound obvious. Uh, if you're going to have a risk management plan, you need to set some objectives. What wasn't obvious was how open you needed to be to revisiting those objectives as you went through the process. So the temptation is to set really aspirational goals um, for your pension scheme funding, or set some great ideas that might be very trustee focused. Um, and again, you know, even being really conscious of that ourselves, we went down the line in a couple of case studies where we were ch later challenged around, well, is this really an appropriate objective from the sponsor's perspective, and do you think that they would really sign up to that? And so from a practical perspective, having that discussion really early with the sponsor, getting them to the table when you're setting objectives, and as you go through the process, when you're on stage three or you get an initial piece of analysis, don't be afraid to go back to those objectives and think, are we really gonna achieve this? Is this really right? Or indeed, could we achieve more? You know, are we actually getting some information from the sponsor that there's more on the table here, or there are different ways that we might be able to look at this to achieve a better outcome? The other piece that we found to be important was governance structure. So as, again, we were working through some quite practical case studies, we were forced to think about how we would actually deliver this in practice. And it became apparent that without a really clear set of roles and responsibilities right up front, you did run the risk of overlap, fees running out of control, uh, people not having the appropriate information sharing pieces in place. So the last thing you might want, for example, is if you've got a meeting set up with the sponsor, that you find that actually there's a whole hold harmless process or non-reliance paper that needs to be produced and signed off before one of your advisors can share some information with another. So setting the terms of engagement really clearly up front and understanding who's going to contribute what to the process is really important. The other piece around governance structure is answering the so what questions. So again, lots of management information will come onto the monitoring later, uh, but if you don't have the right governance structure in place to act on some of that information that you're getting in, uh, then all you've done is go through a fairly expensive and extensive exercise without any real good outcomes. Um, so, I mean, we all know that there's been an explosion in terms of online monitoring tools, and you can see what your pension scheme funding looks like at any minute of any day. Has that resulted in better outcomes? Are we seeing pension scheme funding improve as a result? And if not, the reason for that is inappropriate governance structures that sit behind that management information. So when you move forward from having set it up objectives, governance structure, really collaborative approach, ready to go, um, and you get into the analysis phase. I think there's a danger, and particularly, uh, you know, Colin says we should talk positively about actuaries and the work that we do. I think we should also recognize some inherent biases that we have towards data and process and tools and modeling, uh, and forget some of the softer things around the benefits of having everybody around a table thrashing this out. Uh, and the little pieces of understanding that you pick up almost just incidentally through some of those discussions actually end up being pretty key to the process. So rather than putting a lot of value in making sure that you've got absolutely the right tools or you've done all of the extensive modeling that's ever possible, actually those meetings where you've got people sitting down sharing views can be as important. Uh, and going through that process and developing that understanding of risk around all of the parties that are involved is absolutely crucial. Covenant is key. I think we're all aware of that. That drum has been beaten for a long time. But it's really understanding what about that covenant is key. And what are going to be the key drivers that will make a difference to the outcomes for this particular pension scheme. And I think too often we might focus on a very broad overview of the covenant, maybe inappropriate timescales that we're looking at the covenant over, maybe not enough understanding of the overall industry perspective. Uh, so really trying to tease out from the sponsor 
what it is that they think are going to be the key drivers behind their business, what, what do they think the impact of a particular event relating to the pension scheme would be, and you know, get that information. These, these people running these organizations know a lot about their industry and about their businesses. And so whilst it's really useful to get that sort of third party view from a sponsor covenant, actually having the employer at the table and sharing that information is also really valuable. Uh, then we talked about proportionality. So again, that's something that's been highlighted a lot throughout the regulator's guidance. And it was one of the concerns that, you know, we talked about this paper at a number of events as we were going through the drafting process. And the feedback that we got consistently from other actuaries was, you know, this all sounds great for a really large scheme with lots of resource, but is it appropriate for the smaller schemes? Uh, and what can we do to make it realistic for some of the schemes that we work with that don't have all of the resources available that some of the largest schemes do. One of the things here is that none of this has to be particularly expensive. So if you focus in on the key risks and the key drivers behind the performance in your pension scheme, then actually that might cause you less cost um, and less management time in the long run because you're looking at a smaller set of key issues rather than trying to take a very broad view and sometimes getting it wrong. Also, we now live in a world where a lot of the processing work can be done really cost efficiently. So I would challenge trustees and sponsors when they're concerned about the costs of an integrated risk management process to think about how much they're spending on things that are not adding value to their pension scheme and whether their budget can be better aligned to the objectives that they've set themselves. Plan for the unexpected. So I think we all are well drilled in past experience is not a good guide to the future. Uh, we're never gonna get this absolutely right. Uh, and that's part of the, the process and part of that understanding. Uh, the real value in the discussion is what happens if this doesn't go to plan? What might it look like if it doesn't go to plan? How off plan could we possibly get? And then what are we going to do about that? And that in some ways starts to help drill down what those key risks are because if the answer when you look at, well, what happens if X occurs is shrug, that's okay, we can manage that, then it probably doesn't need to be risk number one on your risk dashboard. Um, but if there's something where you think actually this would be catastrophic or there's probably an easy way to ensure against this that wouldn't cost us that much, then that's an immediate call to action and something that should be looked at. Um, in terms of uh, the outcomes that, that you might think about, don't forget the upside. So it's really dangerous to go down a process where you think, right, risk management, let's find all the risk we possibly can and reduce it and manage its way. Most pension schemes are in a situation where they need to take some risk to generate return. And as long as that risk is being well understood and is being rewarded, then that's absolutely an appropriate thing to do. And there might also be other opportunities as you go along to improve the performance without necessarily increasing the risk. So really be conscious of the upside possibility and how that might be monitored and captured. Uh, integrated monitoring was another point. And again, it might sound really obvious. You've gone through this integrated risk management process. When you're looking at the monitoring information that you get, that should be big picture. And, and the consistent complaint that we get from talking to trustees is, we get a piece of paper from over here, we get another report from somewhere else at a different point in time. Pulling this all together is not something that we can really do. But actually, when you have set a really clear set of objectives, some contingency plans with some triggers, then actually the information that comes to you that says, do you need to act on this? Here's the metric that you've said that we need to understand. This is where we are against that metric. And this is what you said that you would do in a circumstance where this metric is hit. That makes it actually a really easy framework for trustees to start to take decisions. And even if unexpected things happen, they can say, well, we've set these objectives. If we act on this in such a way, does that get us closer or further away from the objective that we've set ourselves? So again, rather than trying to react with imperfect information against a framework that isn't really well understood, that gives trustees the facility to be able to take decisions much more quickly uh, and again, in line with agreed objectives that the sponsors bought into. Which should all result in a simplified valuation process. So, you know, even some of the, the largest schemes that I work with, you do see situations where everybody's got a set of objectives that they've agreed to.
but because they aren't necessarily well defined or have everybody hasn't bought into them completely, you do end up starting from square one again when you roll around to the next valuation. If you can get this right, the investment of time will pay off and that the valuation every three years should just be a point in time recalibration so that you can check whether those objectives are still relevant, whether anything's changed that you should be making changes and report. It shouldn't necessarily be this 15 month headache of trying to reinvent the wheel. And that's where we got to with the 10 commandments, as you said, to put it into practice. Thank you, Marion. Now there'll be a session by Chris Ramsey. We haven't got time to go through all the case studies uh, tonight. Um, so Chris will cover case study A. A um, bit of background on Chris. Chris is, started his career in 2008 and is now a schema tree and associate at Barnet Waddingham London office. Yep. Uh, he also heads up the PPF levy consulting team. So over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so a little bit of an introduction on case study A. Um, this is very much big picture. Um, we haven't dwell, um, delved too much into um, the sort of finer detail of it. And I, I just stress it's very much an example. This isn't, there's no, this isn't the right answer of how to do IRM. It's just, it's just a process that this example um, trustee board and this example um, scheme actually went through. Um, so the situation is that you are um, scheme actually to a medium-sized defined benefit scheme which has been closed for a number of years and um, is, is recently closed to a crew of new benefits. The, the employer is UK based, it's in the automotive sector and the, um, it is in a larger group um, whose um, top company is um, a US based um, company as well. So we looked at two situations in this which we thought were quite different and um, led to quite different outcomes. One where the top company was very ha uh, sorry, one where the top company wasn't willing to give any sort of guarantee and uh, um, any sort of security for the pension scheme, and the second where, where it was. So I'll take each of those in turn. Um, so the trustees come to you, a scheme actor, and say, you know what? Um, we have um, some concerns about the employer covenant here. What should we do? So you, you ring up your friendly covenant advisor and um, ask them to um, give some advice to the trustees, and, and, and this is how the advice goes. There's been a gradual decline in the UK business over time. Trustees are kind of aware of that, but the, the covenant advisor sort of sets that in, in stone. Um, the, the company is um, currently paying £5 million a year of deficit contributions into the scheme, and it can quite happily afford that, um, and could afford, if it really needed to, up to about £12 million a year. But its balance sheet is very weak. It, it doesn't have that much unsecured assets that it could um, give, give to the pension scheme. And also, um, the report talks about sort of the future of the covenant, not just what the covenant is like today, so, for example, um, on investigation, um, to, um, they discover that the top company is planning to relocate some of the car production from the UK into an overseas different company in six years' time, and that's one of the more profitable parts of the business. So there's some question mark about the strength of the covenant after then. And in general, there just seems to be a risk that um, all UK car production could stop um, in the future. So a bit of a gloomy picture. So in, in your advice um, to the scheme, you, you say that the, oh, so on the existing funding basis, the scheme's about 80% funded. Um, on a best estimate basis, actually, they're doing too badly, it's 100% funded. Um, and on a sovereignty basis, you're not really there yet, you're sort of 60% funded. And this is on a basis where you have an investment strategy, 50% in guilt, 50% in um, equity, so quite a risky strategy. Um, after advising the trustees uh, on this, you really say, you know what, guys, you really need to set an objective here. We need to really have a plan as to what we're going to at least try and achieve. It can be modified as time goes on, but let, let's set out with a plan. And after some discussion, you get, the trustees agreed to try and get to buy out by 2030. Why do they set that? Well, they expect that there's going to be limited support beyond 2030 from the UK sponsor. It's not necessarily saying that that UK that that sponsor is going to be insolvent by that point, but might not be able to um, 
to cope with having quite a large pension scheme. And it also happens to be uh, the time where that's around about when the scheme's going to be 100% um, pensioners, so no more deferreds or actives. So what does that, what does that lead you to um, think about? Well, first of all, the first question um, on this is, is this objective achievable? Um, so this chart shows, that the, the green line shows the projection of um, of your um, scheme, fu um, scheme funding level um, in line with sort of prudent um, um, returns. So you, you expect to get to 100% um, funded on a scheme funding basis by 2030, so that's great. But actually you expect to get more than that because they're prudent returns. And so that, that's what the blue line shows and the other orange line is representation of the solvency target. So actually you might expect to get to um, your solvency target by 2030. So is, is that it done? Is that the presentation done? Oh, sadly not. Um, because you're, you're, quite, um, you're taking quite a lot of risk in that process. And this is not something that the trustees really had appreciated before. So you illustrate to them, you don't have to be exact, but a, um, a rough sort of funnel of doubt as to um, how, um, how risky their um, investment strategy is. And they're quite taken aback by this. And actually, if they kept on investing at in 50% in equities, they could be as high as 250% funded by um, 2030 or as, or, as, or as low as 50% funded and very far away from their solvency target. Um, but it's not just a matter of the pension scheme. You also have to think of this poor employer. So this employer has signed up to um, pay £5 million a year in contributions. Um, it can afford that. It's quite happy with that. In six years' time, it's got... It, it's got a bit more problems, maybe affordability has come down, but actually it's looking at a pension scheme where there's an awful lot of risk in the level of contributions that it, um, it's going to have to pay. And so this chart here illustrates uh, the bars are um, sort of increasing the unlikeliness um, hood of, um, get, of paying extra um, deficit contributions. So in six years' time, there's, there's a decent chance actually it won't have to pay anything, so that's great from the employer's point of view. But there's actually 25% ch um, chance that I'll have to pay more than 10 million pounds a year, so more than double um, what it's paying at the moment. And that for an um, employer who's going through um, a process where it's just lost one of the, its biggest um, profit drivers is, um, is quite a difficult thing to get to. So the trustees decide, no, what, guys, we need to um, look at um, some different strategies here. So how do you actually go about assessing those strategies? So you have to take into account the objectives that you set yourself and also the constraints that you're under. And a, a scheme actuary, you go to them and you, you, says, you suggest three things with which to, um, to look at. First of all is, what actually is your chance of getting there? What, what, it may seem obvious, but actually, how likely are you to get to this solvency target? Not just about likelihood getting to the solvency target, though, it's about actually, well, how badly could this go wrong? Um, so a slightly techie um, um, metric there, but basically it's a reasonably bad um, solvency outcome. Um, what, what's a sort of baddish uh, um, so, um, solvency outcome in, 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 um, by 2030? But it's also not about 2030. It's not just about 2030. You've got to get there first. Um, so what's happening with this employer in six years' time? So is it going to be able to pay these um, deficit contributions? So that looks like a major constraint to us when, um, when looking at this, um, um, this situation. So you also want to look at the spread of a reasonably likely range of um, contributions in six years' time. So for example, we may look at the current strategy and then, then compare it to an alternative. So that alternative might be to increase contributions from the current five million pounds a year to seven and a half million pounds a year, but also at the same time to reduce the equity content in the scheme by, by about half. So what does that look like? Well, on the three measures, so we're taking the first one, so chance of getting there, chance of getting to your target, um, that's gone up a little bit. That's great. It's not gone up by much, though, has it? Uh, only 5%. I've I'm, I'm increased my contributions into the scheme by 50%, but my chance of getting there has only gone up by a little bit. Um, and that's basically because you've reduced the, reduced the upside. Re you've reduced the, um, the equity um, content in your scheme. So that's broadly similar, really. Um, the sort of 
um, badish solvency um, outcome. Um, well, with the existing strategy, it's pretty bad at £150 million, pounds, um, which is very, completely unaffordable for the sponsor at that point. But on the alternative, it's actually down at 40. So that, that, that's quite a good situation for the trustees to be in. In the contributions for the, for the employer in six years, uh, the ex existing strategy, you can have anything between naught and 11 million pounds a year, so quite a different um, outcome. Um, on, this, on the revised one, it's a much narrower range, so between something between three and eight, but you've got to take into account of both, both sides of this. You've, you've, you've cut your, your sort of worst case outcomes, but you've also um, lost the, the positive outcomes as well. So after a lot of discussion and debate and, um, between the trustees and the employer and with input from you, you reach, you reach a settlement. So um, what, what does this look like in my completely made up example? Um, you um, maintain the existing funding basis. There's no real reason to um, change that. What you're really focusing on here is solvency. Um, the company agrees to pay more for the first six years because that's when it, it can afford it, but less thereafter. Um, and also the trustees get a commitment to sort of get a share of um, additional contributions if actually the um, employer was to do better than, than, than it expected. They also on the investment side, the trustees do de-risk the uh, scheme, but not to the degree that they considered before because actually they do want to keep some of that upside potential in the scheme and so um, reduce um, equity content to 33% of, of their assets. They also put in place a monitoring framework to see, you know what, we're still not that happy with this level of risk. Let's see if we can reduce it further if, if the opportunity allows. Well, that's great. You've set your strategy. But again, that's kind of not the end of it because things don't go um, as expected, unfortunately. So you have to monitor this over time. So what sort of three things are we um, really concerned about as um, advisors to this scheme? Well, one is de-risking, um, we've already said that, that, that's what we want to do. Two is we want to have a framework which is sustainable in an ongoing situation, so the co deficit contributions are, are affordable by the employer. And thirdly, we want um, a situation that's not too bad in a solvency situation, that we, we can cover um, things if things go really, really badly wrong. So how are we going to monitor this? Well, you need some sort of met metric that... Um, that looks at the scheme. Um, so for de-risking, it's sort of, sort of like solvency level versus expected. For ongoing sustainability, it's some sort of uh, measure of what your recovery plan contributions are based on your current um, position in the scheme, not, not sort of what, what they were before. And um, for a solvency scenario, it's just, your, it's just your solvency deficit. However, that's, not, that's only half the picture. We were supposed to be talking about integrated risk management, and this doesn't. This only considers the scheme. This doesn't consider the employer at all. So actually, you also need to consider how, have a comparator here as to well, actually, it doesn't just matter how my, what my deficit contributions are looking like um, at the moment. Um, if we were to do a valuation today, it also matters um, what the employer could afford. So we need some sort of metric um, around affordability um, of the employer. And your friendly covenant advisor um, says actually EBITDA um, would, would be a particularly good metric for, um, for this employer, for example. And on a, um, for a solvency situation, same, same, same thing. I mean, it doesn't, the solvency deficit is interesting. And if that's going up, then you should be concerned. Um, but just because it's going down doesn't mean that everything's fine because your, um, the strength of your employer might also be getting a lot worse. So it's a comparison, and you, you need to actually make that comparison. Um, but it's, it's not just all about um, sort of financial metrics. There's also a lot of additional monitoring that should be done. So. Um, the trustees and employer agree that they're actually just going to talk about covenant on, on a sort of six monthly basis to make sure that everything is um, fine and that everybody has everything in the open. Um, but also the trustees and employer agree that 
um, this, this six months thing is, is, is kind of not really enough. Um, a lot can happen in six months um, with a business. So they also agree that the trustee, that the employer will let the trustees know if there are any sort of serious things that are going to change in the schemes or so the change in the employer that will affect the schemes or dividend payments to the top company, a restructuring or granting additional security over assets to a third party, for example. So, I mean, what... What do the trustees get out of this, or members get out of this? Well, they get a reduced level of funding and investment risk in their scheme. They've, kind of, they've maintained a good, decent chance of getting their long-term objectives. They haven't hurt that too much. Um, but they have sort of reduced the potential upside from investing in equities. From the UK business point of view, it has increased its short-term cash requirements, which is, is not great, but ultimately, it's reduced the chance of having to pay unaffordable contributions in six years' time, which is, is um, you can't just look at, it can't just look at the short term. It also has to think a little bit longer term as well. So that's the main scenario. Um, I was going to also um, rattle through the alternative scenario. So in this case, the top company is actually willing to um, offer a guarantee to the, um, to the UK um, pension scheme. And in this case, um, the trustees say, OK, well, if you give us that guarantee, we'll, ha we'll happily um, take more investment risk, because I've got a stronger covenant, um, and we'll happily keep the contributions lower. So uh, that, that, that's, that's the offer that the trustees make. Um, your friendly covenant advisor um, says that actually now we're not that fussed about UK company. It, it, it's sort of relevant, but actually the main covenant you're getting is from Topco. And so your attention um, um, changes to the top company. Uh, the covenant advice says, OK, this is company's a lot stronger. It's got a lot um, better um, long-term prospect because it's geographically spread. And it, it, it's, um, it's actually growing. It's not, um, it's not decreasing in size. However, it does say that actually if, if the worst case scenario did occur, it could probably only afford around about 100 million, uh, sorry, 200 million pounds on insolvency. So you discuss the objectives for the scheme in, in this um, context, and you decide that, okay, maybe we don't need to buy out by 2030, but I would quite like to get to be fully de-risked by 2030, because that's when I have no pensioners left. And I'd like to do that without getting the reliance on top company any more than, say, £180 million, so, so a little bit less than the, what they could actually afford. So you then do some analysis um, and say, all right, so what actually... Based on this current strategy that the trustees are running, what what, what does this look like? Um, um, you like sort of looking at the solvency deficit. What does this reliance on this top company um, look like? And you, it, this shows a um, sort of again a fun, sort of funnel of doubt um, on the solvency deficit. And from this, um, you can see that it's not actually that likely that that. Um, reliance on top company will get to um, above 180 million anytime soon. So actually, you're quite happy to run this strategy. So in this alternative scenario, well, on the, on the trustees and members' point of view, you've kept a lot more risk in the, in the scheme. But actually, you've got improved security from, um, for your members because you've got a much stronger employer. So actually, you're, you're quite happy. The UK company is, um, has maintained its cash requirements, so they're, they're obviously quite happy. Um, but it does have a, a higher risk of contributions um, late, um, later on in time. There's no kind of getting around that. Um, but from the top company's point of view, it's got a more profitable UK business because of lower um, contributions. It may have come under pressure to bail out the, um, the UK pension scheme anyway, so may, maybe signing up to this guarantee actually isn't losing that much. And it also has a secondary um, benefit of having um, a reduced PPF levy. So that was kind of a whistle-stop tour of, um, of this case study. Um, but again, it's just, a, it's just an example, really, but of an IRM process in action. That's it. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. I should point out that that particular example was drawn up long before any other yeah. car stories that you may be hearing Very in the press at the moment. So any similarities are purely coincidental. Um, we are slightly ahead of time. Uh, so that gives us a little bit more for questions, as we are now open uh, for questions. Um, I'm looking forward to an interesting and stimulating 33 minutes now. Um, I'd like to encourage as many contributions from the, the floor as possible. May I invite anyone who thinks they may wish to contribute to let me know of their intention? Any hands going up? Okay, just one so far. 
I didn't expect that. Um, Sorry, John you. Spain. Thank you, John. The first thing I want to say is I really want to commend the Working Party for the enthusiasm, the hard work. I just feel it's been a little bit wasted because running behind the whole, all of it is mark to market. The evidence available academically is that mark to market does not work for long term. If you assume that today's conditions, whenever today is, continue forever, you're ignoring volatility which is there. And we've seen this over the last several years. And I was really interested in Paul's slide, slide four, where he used um, move from point as the relevant point to integrated. Well, if you move from point to cash flow instead, one of the real problems actuaries have is that we are still being bullied, as it were, by the outside world into using discounted cash flow capital numbers. This is basically Nokia numbers, whereas we should be using Apple iPad numbers. We should be using far more stochastic cash flows so that you see what's going on. And I would like to have seen the profession taking the opportunity that has just been given to us by DWP in the consultation to think, what can we do better? I'm not talking about going back to the 1990s, 1980s, 1970s, D over I, or anything like that. I'm talking about going forward and taking what was good about the 1980s, 1990s, and there was some of it, and trying to make it better than what we have at the moment. So I think this is a cul-de-sac, but if it works for some, fantastic. I'd like, just like to see a bit more, but thank you for doing all this work. Thank you, John. Um, <laughs> who on the working party would like to respond? <laughs> I, I, I do have a response from that. I don't know whether anybody else wants to go first. But... I mean, I'll, I'll take that, if you like. Um, uh, which is, I think, one of the things we said at the start was that we wanted to discuss the world as it currently was ra rather than as it might be. And that's a serious point in that we were seeking, you know, the system is regulated in a particular way at the moment, which has strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we seek to provide some tools to deal with that. Um, it may be that a better system comes along. That's a good debate to have, but, but that wasn't our remit. I also think that this is absolutely applicable to the environment that you describe. And it comes back to setting objectives. There are a number of employers for whom the market value of removing this risk from their balance sheet is very relevant. Yep. And so marking to that objective is absolutely the right yep. thing to do. Um, there are others where the size of the sponsor relative to quite a small pension scheme is such that you can take a much longer approach. And there's nothing within IRM that says that you can't look at a cash flow type model and managing your cash flows as and when they fall due and, and timing the returns from your investments to meet that. So, as long as you've got the sponsor sitting behind that risk, that's fine. The reason that you come back to this mark-to-market approach is the risk that the employer becomes insolvent, and then the way the regulations are written at the moment, you've got a, you have got a market where there's a cost for securing those liabilities. Yeah, I mean that, that's basically exactly what I was going to say as well. If you have, if you have, a, yeah, if if you have a if you have a stated objective to get a buyout, then mark-to-market is very relevant, and I think you should consider it if it's. Um, if you are taking a lot longer term point of view, then I can understand um, where you're coming from. But if, you're, if your objective is buyout, then I think you have to, because that's what insurers do. And, and I'm not sure, I haven't gone out and checked, but I have a feeling at least three and possibly four of our case studies do have stochastics in them, so we're sort of there. Thank you. There are three members of the working party on the front row. Would you like to add anything? Uh, if you just have the microphone down at the front, please. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm Locke Marv, another member of the Working Party. Uh, just to respond on a couple of points, I guess. Um, I, I don't necessarily agree that our approach for applying IRM is equivalent to assuming that current conditions will continue indefinitely into the future. It's not something I would necessarily recognise from our discussions. Um, the, the main point, however, is... Um, I think most of us will be aware that recently in the press there's quite a lot of talk about 
the deficiencies of a market-based approach and whether that means going back to assessed value or something slightly different. I guess, I mean, from, from the things that I've seen, the alternative approaches seem to be just a different way or a different set of language to describe essentially the same problem. Uh, for example, you know, saying that discounting is very old school and projecting forward is, is kind of the future. Uh, to me, they're just kind of the same thing described in two different directions. So, I mean, especially some, some of the stuff I've seen in the press where it seems to be claiming that looking at things in a different way may make the problem go away or may make you realize that there wasn't a problem to start with. To me, that seems somewhat, uh, I, I guess, magical in the way that, you know, we've got lots of schemes that probably are not as well funded as they could be. They're taking a fair chunk of risk with an uncertain sponsor covenant to, so, to say that, you know, you could look at it in a different way and maybe we all realize there, there isn't that, that big a problem. Um, I haven't seen that in, in the kind of cases I've worked with. Sorry, you've started it now. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's Chenu Patel. Um, uh, I was a member of the Working Party and uh, I'm also employed at the regulator. So uh, on, 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 on this point, we do have something to say, so I, I won't preface this by saying these are not the regulator's views, because mark-to-market is relevant in certain circumstances and not in others. Um, so if you think it's irrelevant, think about a very mature scheme which is underfunded, your pensioners are going out at mark to market. You're paying them 100p in the pound at current market rates. You live in a benign market uh, uh, conditions. If, you, if, you, if that scenario lasts for five years, you might find that in five years' time, uh, the pensioners have walked out with half your assets and the scheme was underfunded. Now you tell me that this is a long-term thing and in 20 years' time, it would all have come good and I wouldn't buy it. Sure. Well, John, to respond, and if the rest of you can think about questions to ask, that would be uh, great. I do not believe the mark to market is always wrong. If I gave that impression, I apologise. You can only go off market if you have A, a decent covenant, and B, long enough to use that covenant. So you're probably talking about 15 years. Shuna's example would not be that. You would have had to have been looking to mark to market just to match the assets as best you can. But not all schemes have been or are still in that situation. And I think going off market can work in some circumstances, but it is proscribed by the regulator, unfortunately. And this is an opportunity for the profession to think again and say, well, hang about, something else might work very well indeed. Thank you, John. I'm sure this isn't the first time we've had a debate between market value and off-market values in this hall. Um, any further questions? One Gentleman at the back. Oh, hello, my name's John Mannion. Um, just the point on collaboration. My experience has been that collaboration is a lot easier when there's a lot of money around. And um, when there isn't, all oh, the company's under pressure, uh, collaboration falls away or it never existed in the first place because the objectives probably aren't compatible uh, to start with. I I'm kind of questioning whether collaboration is the best route. I, I think sometimes you have to decide it's going to be a negotiation and then the best way for whichever party you're advising to get their objectives best met, you, you have to start from that point of view. And you may legally have to start from that point of view in a number of circumstances. So I'm kind of just interested in, if you take your scenario A, um, you went through, which I think was very good. Um, if I was a union representative on the trustee committee, I might say this is a great way to say, you're going to have to pay in the whole 12 million a year or something more, unless you promise to keep our plant open in six years' time. In other words, I bring in something else to change the whole landscape of my covenant. You know, in other words, it's going to be very expensive for them to shut the factory or to deal with something. And I just kind of wonder if you have any views, which is my question, if you have any views of what professionals you have found best to deal with that negotiation side, um, because it's often not the actuaries. I think, 
think there's probably quite a lot in that question around the role of collaboration uh, and then who's best to undertake when it gets to a negotiation situation. I think starting off from a position of trying to, trying to collaborate and going through the IRM framework actually helps you to identify those potential areas of stress uh, where the two sets of objectives might diverge. So that, I think, is quite an important thing to have up front. And, and by collaboration, we don't by any stretch mean that everybody all gets on and has the same objectives and that there's not, never any tension. Um, but it does mean that you're quite clear on where the specific points of differences are rather than trying to negotiate everything that's on the table actually in a number of situations. If you look at it through a slightly different lens, you find that things that might look good for the trustees are actually in practice quite good for the company as well. So the, the example that you gave around, well, you know, you pay us everything now, um, or promise to keep the, the plant open in six years may not actually be that, that feasible uh, and may not be great for the longer term recovery uh, of what you're actually gonna get out of that employer. Um, and also the relationship with the top co, you may never get to that um, guarantee scenario if you start with this is our position and this is not, you know you're gonna have to talk us down from this so I think collaboration still plays an important part even if you do end up in a negotiation situation you might at least be focusing on the key key areas of negotiation in terms of who's best to do it I think almost every profession is a mixed bunch and it's really hard to stereotype and say you know you should get your lawyer in because they're going to be great at, at negotiating the finer points or you should get your actuary to do it because they really understand the technicalities and will be able to baffle the other side or you know it, it depends on which points are, m are most key yeah. uh, and who's actually got the the knowledge and the, the certainty around that um, and in some cases it might be that it's not one of the advisors, that it's one of the trustees uh, having a conversation with the company. And in some cases that negotiation may need to be multi-pronged. You might need to take it offline um, and have somebody from the trustees talk to a representative of the company before the meeting. Um, you may then have two actuaries discussing ahead of time what needs to happen. I think working out where the key points of differences are ahead of time and who's best to try and sort those out is probably your your best bet in terms of that, that negotiation process. Would anyone else like to add to that? No, I don't think I'm cool. uh, uh, yes, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I, I absolutely get the point that interests can be asymmetric uh, and even confrontational, uh, partly. Uh, unfortunately, it's a reality. Um, but I think the starting point of a common platform of information that people can use to frame rational economic choices is incredibly valuable. Um, and when information is presented in such a way that, you know, is a joint view of the world of covenant, for example, the investment professionals, the actuarial professionals, at least it gives some sort of anchor point for a, an economically rational discussion. And, and then I think you get into the world of economically rational choices. So to take the example that Chris just put up here, um, it may well be the case that I could say as a trustee, look, we are prepared to allow you to go on more on risk and on an expected returns basis, if that's the funding basis you use, your deficit will reduce and your employer will need to put less cash into our section or other or scheme, all other things being equal. But you know what? You're going to have to give us a guarantee. And once you start to think in terms of those rational economic trade-offs built on your platform of information, I would argue that IRM is a valuable process. Not always. I'm not, I'm not through rose-tinted spectacles. We all appreciate that some situations just get stuck in the weeds for months, if not years. But if possible, just getting that platform around which to have some rational and open discussions is helpful. Quite often one finds, I think, that the platform of information is quite illuminative for the company as well as for the trustee. And starting to understand how these various flows move together and what the meaning of the word risk actually means, FDs find really quite helpful. Um, so I, I absolutely get it that it's a risk of rose tinted spectacles, but by the same token, would contest as a starting point, trying to build a common platform and having economically rational discussions from that is a useful starting point. Does anyone else like to add anything? Jay. Just at the front here.
Thank you. Uh, James Wintall from Willis Towers Watson. And uh, like John earlier, I'd like to, to thank the Working Party for the, uh, all the work that's gone in the presentation today. And I think I probably should also thank you, Paul, for the, for the name check earlier. Um, but, but like the, the, the previous speaker, I think I want to uh, explore a little bit more about the, the process of reaching agreement and the collaboration piece. Um, what obviously one of the things uh, Marion said, I think it was the 10th commandment about simplified valuations. Uh, I think it's a holy grail that everyone would be very pleased with, not having to battle through you know, 15 months worth of, of, of discussions every valuation cycle. But, but being able to do that appears to be predicated on having had at the previous valuation a discussion not only about how to wrap up that valuation, but about how to wrap up all conceivable future valuations. Um, and, and my experience has been, it, it can be quite difficult getting uh, the two different parties, the, the trustees and the employer, or even three different parties, depending on the, uh, the provisions and the rules and whether the actuary needs to give an underpin or not, getting those parties to agree anything for a single valuation is challenging enough. How on earth do you get them to agree how they're going to uh, agree all future valuations? Um, the, the comments Paul made about the, the economic reality and the rational conversations um, and, you know, based on the sorts of charts that, that Chris showed us earlier, I, I think is great in, in, in theory, and I would love that to happen. Unfortunately, I don't think that any of the analysis that Chris showed was uh, objective fact. It's all subjective based on underlying assumptions. And in my experience, trustees and employers can have significant discussions and disagreements about the underlying um, projections that, that are used. And if you can't agree those, then having that rational discussion about you know, the economic risk trade-offs is impossible if you don't agree with the, with the underlying, underlying framework. Um, which is, I think, a long way of me saying, I would love to get to those, those future simplified valuations. Um, but the bit that seemed to be a bit skipped over from my point of view was, how do you really get those different parties to agree all the future details of all those different objectives and how they're going to react to all future uh, situations. Any hints or tips you can give us would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> so I, I think that probably comes back to one of the other commandments, which was plan for the unexpected. Uh, and what we're not saying is that you need to tie down all future valuations and all the details of every future valuation um, and have that all you know, fully completely agreed. Uh, right up front. It's what do we do when things don't turn out as expected? What are our objectives? And if we're moving away from that, what's the plan for getting back? If we're doing better than that, what's the plan for capturing that opportunity? So I don't think that any of us believe that you get to evaluation date and it's just a tick in the box and we'll just report that off to the regulator and it's all fine. Things will have changed during that time. But hopefully within an IRM process, you've dealt with that at the time that those things have happened, rather than having this backlog that you're trying to work to um, when you hit that, that new valuation date where it all comes as a big surprise. Now, the reality of the world is that things are, are more difficult in practice than they will be in this theoretical world. But if you can get some clear principles agreed that everybody's signed up to and can work towards, then you'll remove some of the contentious issues that happen when there's a surprise or you know people see a result that they weren't expecting and you're having to start from square one as to what do we actually do about that. Tim, Chris, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with that. And, and also that... Uh, it's not necessarily appropriate to worry too much about all the details of the next valuation, but it does help if you've got to the bottom of what the really important moving parts are, because they, would, they probably won't change. And you know, some, of, some of these discussions, you know, we, we've hardly mentioned in the papers setting the technical provisions, because maybe it's not the most important thing in most valuation negotiations, and the, the parties may feel obliged to spend a lot of time on it, but, but is it actually a driver of the outcome? Um, or is it really that it will always be about how much cash flow the employer can realistically afford, in which case the fact that everyone accepts that is a step forward, even if there'll have to be a, a haggle over the presentation in the future? Yeah, I, mean, I completely agree with that. I think just picking up one point you said um, about the sort of analysis, I guess I would always use the... I don't think analysis can get you an answer. It can aid helping you aid a process, but actually 
the vast, the best um, way of getting to an answer is to having discussion and thinking about things very broadly. And the sort of analysis that I showed is a is a way of doing that, is a way of helping you do that, but it, it's by no means the, the all or even the, the most important part. Lock, uh, Chinu, Andrew, anything to add? Okay. Any further questions? Stephen. Thank you, Stephen Rees at uh, Capita. Uh, there's a couple of things that I've noticed in practice that often seem to happen. One is I often start a valuation process by trying to uh, tease out what sort of a relationship there is going to be between the trustee body and the, the employer. And nearly always everybody starts off saying, oh, it's going to be ever so collaborative and very consensual. <laughs> and about half the time, that's true, and about the other half of the time, it turns out about halfway through the process not to be true at all. And by that time, often you find that uh, the, there's an asymmetry going on because the trustees have got a much more open style. Uh, they've got um, uh, just more open uh, issues with the way that information is shared compared with the way that uh, an employer might conduct its business. And so uh, in those half of the cases that do switch from collaboration into negotiation, suddenly the trustees are in a very difficult position compared with the... Uh, the employer, and I think that's an unhelpful thing that would be worth trying to do something about if we're if we're trying to change the way that uh, this system all operates. But my other point is that I'm just conscious that uh, we've got a uh, slightly self-selected audience here because we're all the actors who are interested enough in this subject to to, to come along and uh, come to this sort of discussion. The reality is that uh, a lot of the decisions here are going to be made by trustees, and there's a lot of work to be done uh, somehow. Uh, in engaging more trustees in the whole process rather than just interested actuaries. And there's even more work still to be done to get employers to engage properly and to be able to influence uh, the way that employers approach this whole subject. And I would really like, if it's possible, for the working party to develop into those two areas about when does collaboration turn into negotiation and what to do about it, and how to get the real decision makers as opposed to the advisors properly engaged in the whole process. Thank you, Stephen. I, I do know that the profession is keen to, to make the most of this report. So whether it's a case, first of all, speaking to actuaries, and then who else can we speak to about it? Uh, it's a good point. You know, how do you get trustees and sponsors involved? Uh, Tim, Chris, would you like to I'll, I'll make a comment? This, I'll have a go at the second one. Uh, so the, on, on the second one, I think it's really about focusing on the big picture, really. If you can... If, uh, we, we as actuaries like lots of technical detail about what I don't know, mortality assumption to use and what, whether or not to use an equity risk premium or, or, or whatever it is. Well, it's really actually, as we kind of said before, taking a step back and really thinking about the big picture can, and, and not worrying so much about the sort of little minutiae that I think can help trustees and employers get engaged actually to sort of forget a lot about the, the, the little technical bits and sort of focus more on actually what is really, really important to this scheme, monitoring that and, and getting agreement over those things. I think this is the, the way I would um, see um, that working. And also, I think there's a challenge for us as a profession is to being able to explain those in a bit of a simpler way, not a very technical way, just getting over those key points in, um, in the discussions. Lock. Uh, Marion, anything to add? I was just going to say, actually I'm seeing quite a lot more engagement, particularly from employers around the pension issue and the risk that they see the pension scheme poses to their business. Uh, and that's probably to do with the, the increasing size of deficits, but also the fact that pensions has been in the press so much, um, and as well as the sort of risk disclosures that employers are now having to make as well. So we are seeing employers come to the table much more in terms of engaging with the valuation process. And that probably has a knock-on effect of the engagement with trustees, but absolutely take a point that there's more needed in that area, and mm -hmm. particularly around the governance frameworks that are needed to really act on this, because a lot of this becomes so what. If You know, you can do a lot of work. If you don't get to um, the right outcomes, if, you, if you're not getting to a position where people can take decisions and really take action to improve the outcomes, then you're wasting your time with a lot of this. So engagement is absolutely critical. Anything to add from the front row? Any further questions? Ah, hand at the back. Uh, 
Francis Fernandez, advisor to Lincoln Pensions. Uh, just looking from the outside in and picking up on Steve's point about collaboration, is there something that actually the profession can do more in terms of actually linking up the investment and the actuarial sides? So actually, there's a lot of collaboration trying to be put forward between the covenant advisors and the investment consultants and the scheme actuaries. But in my experience, I still think there's quite a big gap to be bridged between the scheme actuaries and the investment consultant. So take an example, scheme might be running a LDI hedge strategy where actually the reference curve might be swaps. You still see a lot of actuaries using gilt curves and actually to the consternation of a lot of employers, that's introducing basis risk. If the two sides talk to each other, that would be addressed quite early. So in the spirit of just, I'd be quite interested to know how many investment consultants are here and how many pension actuaries are here. It might be easier to ask how many investment uh, consultants are here rather than pensions <laughs> actuaries. Three, four. Okay, definitely more pensions. Um, and <laughs> any, any thoughts on that observation from Francis? I, I guess from my perspective, I think we're certainly in my firm, not to pick up my firm too much. Uh, I, I think we are quite good at um, engaging um, actuaries and investment consultants. Um, I mean, we, we certainly, even externally, I, I think as a profession, we're getting much better at that already. Um, I think there's a lot more work to be done on, uh, cover, <coughs> on, on the covenant side, but I guess from my perspective, what I've seen is, is pretty good engagement between actuaries investment con and investment consultants, but I'd certainly agree it's really important. It's, it's, it's crucial, in fact. It really is a, you need to have that, otherwise, if your strategy is going off in one direction, your investment strategy is going off in one direction, your funding strategy is going off in another direction, that's, that's a recipe for disaster, and it's just it's, it's not, not going to work. And just to be clear, we do have a, a couple of investment specialists on the working party helping us with the case studies, so um, you make a really valid point. It, it's important to have that collaboration on, and we, we did recognise that. But, but I guess I'd put my tongue slightly in my cheek and, and offer a challenge to those in leadership positions of firms that have both investment consulting and, and scheme actuary operations and, and treat them as two separate tribes um, which develop different ways of, of thinking. And, and not, well, I think I perhaps know how we got into that situation, but we ought to think about how we can get out of it. I'm looking at Locke now as I know he does uh, actuarial and investment work on a, on a day to day basis. I'm wondering if he has anything to add. We got the microphone. Just here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, clearly I agree with the importance of linking the funding actuarial side and the investment side. Uh, I think uh, the general principle I go on is, you know, if it's a good, sensible decision on the investment side, then it should be good news on the funding side. Rather, than, so in other words, you don't want to artificially punish someone for taking an investment decision just because you happen to be looking at the liabilities in a particular way, which is the same way as you looked at it three years ago, which is the same way as you looked at it six years and nine years ago. So, I mean, particularly in the space of kind of LDI and hedging, uh, that's probably the area where maybe I come across that more than others, where because of the way you happen to be looking at the liabilities, then hedging doesn't look like a particularly good idea, even though you're re removing risk, so you're kind of almost leading uh, to, to, uh, to an unfavorable uh, outcome in a way. Um, and I mean, partly that's because of, you know, different methods of funding, particularly whether, whether you're looking at your asset returns relative to liability returns or relative to other things like pension increases, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I mean, I absolutely agree with the importance of joining the two together. Thank you. We've probably got time for about one more question. Any, any final show of hands? While we've got time, I'll just ask a question of the, uh, the working party. Um, the, the Green Paper uh, was published earlier this year, and there are quite a few concepts in there, some of which might have an impact on integrated risk management or actually be ideally suited to, uh, to go into an integrated risk management framework. Have you thought at all about how any of this analysis might be different for, say, a, a stressed scheme, one where conditional indexation might be allowed in future? Open question. 
Funnily enough, my case study was quite close to that, <laughs> where months before um, anything that's been in the press recently, we, we had the example of a, an employer um, who wasn't able to support the pension scheme, and it was a decision as to whether you run that on um, and what the investment strategy behind that might look like. And again, it comes back to the, the framework for taking decisions and setting objectives. If you've got a clear objective and you've, you're just adding some additional levers that you might be able to pull into that discussion, you then have a good framework for looking at, well, what, if we pull that lever, what does that do to our chance of achieving these objectives? And you can take those rational economic decisions rather than trying to have some knee-jerk reactions or, or deal with things on the fly um, without that clear framework in place. I think perhaps the other thing that's really important there is that it facilitates a collective understanding of what the big issues and the moving parts are. And I think that's even more important in a, in a defined ambition um, with mm. profits, whatever you want to call it, that, that you know, we, the history is that defined ambition defined, um, turned into defined benefit because nobody understood those distinctions. So if we are going to go back to operating in a defined ambition mode, we absolutely need to have that discussion around what the real moving parts are and who's trading risk with who. Mm. Okay. Any contributions? Chile? Yeah, I'd say... So I'd say it really allows you to uh, look at potential solutions in a different light uh, if, you, if you look at these in an integrated manner. So if we take Marion's case exam, uh, case uh, study, which had virtually no component, uh, and therefore if the proposition is schemes like that, for example, ought to be consolidated into one big fund, uh, and, 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 and then uh, we can try and capture the free lunch out of the uh, investment efficiency and admin efficiency and all of that. So the IRM framework allows you, now there's a proposition, there's a hypothesis there that uh, this type of solution might give you uh, uh, an answer. And the IRM framework allows you uh, to actually examine the, the, the new moving parts, the new issues within, within that context. So I think uh, um, this framework is ideally suited um, to changing strategies with none of these uh, uh, funding investment strategies are uniquely defined, and therefore a little tweak here or there on funding or investment uh, leaves you asking what would the out outcome be 15, 20 years hence, and, and, and does that take you from a bad place to a good place? Uh, that's what IRM will hopefully show you. Further? Just about on time, so if I can uh, ask Tim to close. For those of you who don't know Tim, Tim Keo is a, a veteran of scheme funding debates, having worked on these issues for many years at Mercer and then the pensions regulator. He's now enjoying what he says is his third age, uh, but got involved in the working party to deal with some unfinished business from the scheme funding code of practice. Um, and I should point out that Tim's last sessional paper was on implementation of the MFR in 97, for which you won a prize. Read into that what you will. Thank you, Tim. Well, yes, thank you. Um, I don't know if you just um, threw up the, uh, the final slide there. Um, first of all, thanks for the contribution from the floor. Uh, my job is to summarise the whole meeting. I'm not going to respond to all the comments, but I just, just want to rework some of the broad themes. Um, I think, for me, the most important of the Ten Commandments is number four there, that, that the value is in the process, and that's actually illustrated by the, the debate we've had this evening. And there are many of these points which actually we as experts can get quite fed up discussing, but that's because we've discussed them before, maybe in other situations. But all the various stakeholders involved haven't necessarily had that conversation. So it is really important to actually go through these tensions and work through to, to what, what's really important, and, and there isn't a substitute for it. And, and we found that as we developed each of the case studies and, 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 and had to go through that, that process. Um, the issues are often totally different between different schemes. Um, some of you may not actually have looked at all the case studies before the, this evening, but if you do, you'll find that they're all, they're totally different. They're even differently presented, and we had a long debate about whether we should put them in a standard format or have the same metrics, but, but actually the whole point was not um, that a particular scheme, there will be particular things that are important and you need to work out what those are. Um, I hope you all find the worked examples, the case studies useful, but it's more likely that you'll mix and match pieces of them rather than say, oh yeah, case study C is fantastic, that's just what I need for, for my client. Um, I guess another 
issue that's really important is the proportionality. I mean, my experience was at TPR where we saw lots of work that had been done for billion pound schemes with million pound budgets and done all of this stuff. Um, and to some extent, I think the work of the working party has been to, to, to take that intellectual capital and recycle it. So uh, thank you very much, uh, those employers and the main that, that paid for that. But the real challenge is actually for the smaller schemes. I, I do need to remind myself that the median scheme is between 10, 10 and 20 million pounds in size, depending on uh, what you measure and when you measure it. And for them, it's absolutely crucial not to do analysis for analysis sake, only to analyze things that, that really matter and monitor things that really matter, and ideally to use information and analysis that's already there. And particularly if it's on the business side, the chances are there will be quite a lot of business analysis there. So make use of that rather than uh, creating new stuff. Um, it might also be that scenario planning is more useful than stochastic modeling if you know, actually five versions of the future will be enough to understand what's really important rather than feeling you have to do a thousand. Uh, now, there's a lot of debate this evening around what collaboration means uh, and whether that's fine as long as it lasts, but, but actually it breaks down, but there's no money. But I, but I hope we've illustrated that even if there has to be hard negotiation, at least you can dispense with a lot of the things that, that aren't important. And actually, maybe sometimes the solution to that is actually to ask the employer to put up first, rather than the trustee lead all of this and then find the employers in a totally different place um, when it suits him. That, that was the purpose of case study C, which was based on it's the employer's problem, they've got this scheme, so they come up with a solution. And yes, the trustees may want to make sure that's strong enough, but, but say it's the employer's baby, so why not let them take the lead? Um, and that in particular might then help with uh, consistency between valuations and, and the point was I think strongly made that I can't really expect to define exactly how the next 10 valuations will be conducted and it would probably be a mistake to do so because the world will not be as we've assumed it. Uh, but if you get some idea of what's really important, uh, it becomes less of an event and more part of the process. And the analogy for me is that I think if you're running a business, you have a business plan and you monitor the business and that's a permanent process. And at the end of every year, the auditors will come in and check the accounts and that may lead to changes in how you run your business. But the business plan is the driver. And, and I think our model of how a pension scheme run, is run is the same, that there's a, there's a plan which describes how that works and then the valuation is part of the audit process. Um, there was a lot of discussion here, I think, on the education of parties not in the room, and particularly trustees and employers. Um, I think that's important, but to be honest, I think that's probably the job of the people in the room, in that there's so much, only so much one can do by way of general education. Ultimately, employers and trustees are individuals that need to spend quality time being, being educated, and I think that, that's probably uh, the day job. Um, interest in the discussion at the beginning on mark to market. Uh, I hope it was clear that mark to market has its place, particularly until such time as we come up with a, a, a better approach, which everyone can agree on. And personally, I think that may be some time, but if we do uh, well and good. But nevertheless, um, it's not right just to look at it in today's terms. And I think most of the, the modeling we've done, we've tried to focus on what's the position in X year's time when you do actually have to transact in the market and what's the range of possible market situations because that's what really matters. Um, finally, I, I want to make a point on actuarial leadership. Uh, one of the things we encountered a lot when we, when we took this around the country at previous sessions uh, was uh, the extent, was who should lead this work um, and how does it fit in with the role of the scheme actuary? Uh, now, as a working party, I think we're quite agnostic on who should do it and who they work for. The important thing is that it gets done and it gets well, and actually for the whole thing to be done well involves the input of a lot of different parties, and that's come up again and again. Um, but I do think that actuaries are pretty well placed to be the person that, that pulls all this together. I think every scheme should have a controlling mind who's a person that, that actually gets how all these pieces fit together and could really explain it rather than say, I've got lots of help, people that have, that have, that have helped me to this position. 
uh, and that might be a trustee or it might be any of the advisors. Uh, but I have to say, the Parliament did say the only or one of the few advisors you must have is a scheme actuary, and they probably thought that that would be the financial person that, that, that made sure that the financial strategy of the scheme really worked. Uh, so at the risk of upsetting non-actuaries who do this job pretty well too, um, I, I would suggest that everyone here should grab the opportunities uh, to, to lead in this area because both pension schemes and the profession will be better for it. Thank you, Tim. If I can just echo that comment about you know, taking this forward, if you haven't read the paper cover to cover yet, feel free to do so. The, it, it is quite an easy read. It's not, it is digestible. And there will be things in there that are relevant and you can use with your clients. Um, it remains for me to express my own thanks and I'm sure the thanks of all of us to the authors, the opener, the closer, and all those who participated in this evening's discussions. I must admit, I was getting a bit worried when only one hand went up at the start, so uh, thank you very much to those who contributed. Um, it would also be helpful for those preparing the transcript of the discussion for the British Actuarial Journal if you could hand any prepared notes to members of the events team at the back of the hall as you leave uh, for the evening. There won't be a drinks reception after the event tonight, so it just uh, is with me now just to say thank you very much for your contributions and I wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you.